of my professors in vet school always said that in order to recognize the abnormal, first you have to know what's normal. So I was just going to cover some normal things um, for pets. So in a dog, normal heart rate's usually between about 60 and 160 beats per minute. Smaller dogs usually have faster rates, and big dogs usually have lower rates. So if you're at home and your Great Dane has a heart rate of 160, that's probably bad. If you have a little Maltese or a little teacup Yorkie and the heart rate's 50, that's also probably bad. Um, the easiest way to count heartbeats, so I brought, I didn't bring a real dog, but if this is a dog, the heart sits right behind the front legs. So what I usually do if you're trying to feel at home is put your hand across until you can feel, you should feel like your heartbeat's going boom, boom, boom. I usually count for 15 seconds and multiply times four. So if you get 20 in 15 seconds, the heart rate is 80. I don't, people, for some reason, people don't seem to always know how to do that. I think probably, oops, because I talk to people when it's an emergency and everybody's panicking. Um, cats, you can do the same thing. Cats don't always like being touched there, so if you have a sensitive cat, you may not want to do that, because I prefer people not to get bitten. Um, respiratory rates can be really hard. That's how quickly they're breathing. Um, a lot of dogs will pant, and that can be totally normal. If your cat is panting, that's probably not a good sign. Um, most cats should not pant. Um, the other thing with dogs is that when they're breathing, their heart rates can change with their breathing rates. So sometimes the heart, instead of being completely regular where it's going boom, 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 it'll, it, you'll hear a couple beats, it'll say boom, boom, there'll be a little pause, boom, boom, boom. That can be normal in a cat, in a dog. Um, and when you're looking at respiratory rate at home, I usually look for increased effort. So if it looks like your dog's really, or cat is really struggling to breathe, that's not a good sign. Um, normal temperatures, they do run warmer than we do, so they're usually between 101 and 103. And that's why when they sit with you at night when it's cold, you're happy to have them on your lap. Um, cats, heart rates in cats tend to run a little bit faster than dogs, so they tend to be between about 140 and 220. Respiratory rates usually are 20 to 40-ish. If they're purring, that can change it. Um, if you can't tell if your cat is purring, if you put your hand on its throat, you usually can feel it rumbling, and that'll mean it's purring. You guys have cats or dogs or cats, dogs? Okay. Anybody have other weird animals? Snakes, lizards, no? Okay. Um, cat temperatures are the same as dog temperatures. Um, so other normals, so mucous membranes, which is like the gums um, and the tongue, usually should be pink. The only exception is some animals that are black will have pigment on their gums, and that can be totally normal. Um, and chow chows or chow chow mixes will have purple tongues, and again, that's normal. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and body condition. So I just like to talk about this. It doesn't really relate to first aid. Uh, but people always wonder if their dog is fat, thin, or normal. Um, so the best thing I've learned is the hand technique. So if you hold your hand like this and you rub your fingers across it, that should be what the ribs feel like. If you close your hand and the ribs feel like that, they're too skinny. Um, oh, actually, I take that back. Sorry. If you hold your hand like this and rub it, that's what it should feel like. This is too skinny and this is too fat. So you should be able to feel the ribs, but they shouldn't be really bumpy. <coughs> Okay, so normal gums. So this dog has fairly normal gums. You can see the little teeth. Gums are pretty pink, so that is normal. This animal, you can probably tell the gums are really pale, so they're almost white looking. And then there's these little, like, red dots up there. So that's actually bleeding into the gums. So that is definitely not normal. <clears throat> this dog's tongue's a little bit pale. You know, usually it should be nice and pink. Um, and his is a little bit off color. This is yellow, so this usually means liver disease. Um, most of the time, they won't get that yellow. When you're looking for yellow, if you look at the eyes, you'll see the yellow, or sometimes on the insides of the ears. This is a cat. So this cat has red, red gums. That's not an emergency. It just means the cat has some dental issues. If the tongue looks like that, or like this one, they need to go to the vet on emergency. That's bad. That means they are not oxygenating, like the blood is not getting around and giving oxygen to the cells. <clears throat> okay, so CPR. Everybody always wants to know about CPR. Um, CPR in people and animals, the survival rate with CPR is really low. So only about 3% of animals or people that have CPR are going to make it out of the hospital back home. So I always tell people, if you're going to try it, I mean, they're already dead. You're not going to kill them, so you might as well give it a shot. Um, 
it's very similar in animals as to people. So you want to do co chest compression. The only different, little bit of difference is chest compression. So usually you want to compress it across the chest. If they're lying on their side and it's a big dog, you can put a hand about where you think the heart is and just compress down. Um, it does take a fair amount of force. You know, you can still do the staying alive, which is what you're supposed to do for people, and compress. Um, airway's a little bit harder, but you can hold the nose and breathe and give them a breath. The big thing I tell people is if you're doing that, make sure that you take breaths, because what people tend to do is they hold the nose and they go, and then they pass out. So if you're doing that, try not to pass out um, and do a couple breaths, breathe for yourself, do a couple more breaths. And ideally, somebody should be doing that while you're trying to get the pet to the hospital. But the survival rate's very low. Um, the ones that I've had that survive CPR, it's usually like an anesthetic episode where something happens. Most other things, if your pet's sick enough that it actually dies, um, you're probably not getting it back. Um, and the other thing is before you start CPR, check for a heartbeat, because um, you don't want to be doing chest compressions if they have a heartbeat. Anybody, anything else anybody wants to know about CPR? <laughs> He's quiet. Okay, bee stings. This is the other question we get a lot, bee stings. So for most pets with bee stings, it's not a big deal. Um, similar to people, so most people can get stung by bees and don't have a problem. If you happen to be allergic to bees, you'll swell up. So the same thing with dogs. Um, I would say most of the, the dogs that I see with swelling, you don't really know what happened to them. They just come in, and I've had them come in with like one whole side of the face is puffed up and you can't see the eyeball. Um, I've had just little hives all over the whole body. Um, and those guys, most of the time we do Benadryl. Um, there are a few conditions where it's not safe. So if you're concerned, I would talk to your vet before you give it and make sure it's safe for your pet. Um, the big ones probably if you have seizures or heart disease, you don't really want to give Benadryl. Um, these are bee stings. Ticks. The last time I did this, I had a lot of questions about ticks. So ticks, we have a lot of ticks in New England. Um, I will pass around my little so this is a picture of a tick, and then it has some how big the actual ticks are for deer ticks. So I will pass that on. So ticks can be really tiny, or they can be pretty big. Um, and let's see where the rest of my tick tools. So for some reason, everybody thinks if you pull the tick off and the head is stuck to the dog, that it will continue to burrow through the dog. If you pull the head off, the tick is dead. It is not going to continue to burrow the body will eventually wall it off and it'll come off the dog. Um, so you don't really have to worry about getting the whole head except that it'll cause a lot of inflammation. Um, what I usually do is grab like right down sort of between the tick and the body and just pull slowly backwards. I do tweezers. Um, there are these little like tick twisty things that you can slide over the tick and pull it off. Um, I've had people do Vaseline to try to get the tick to back out. Cats do not get tick diseases. For whatever reason, they're resistant. So if your cat has a lot of ticks, you don't really have to worry about them getting diseases. Um, the biggest problem I see with cats is a lot of uh, outdoor cats like to get little tiny ticks right around their eyes, and they're really hard to get off. Um, and cats also don't like to sit still while you're trying to find the tick. So you feel the tick, and you try to look through the fur, and then the cat says, I am done with this, and it leaves. Um, but cats don't really get tick diseases. You can't get a tick disease from your pet. The only thing I warn people is like if your dog, or dog comes up positive for Lyme or one of the other tick diseases, you're out in the same area as your dog. So you know, you're potentially getting exposed to the same diseases. Um, I do recommend doing some type of preventative. So there's all different ones for dogs now. You can do topicals, you can do chewables, there's a few collars that work fairly well. But I would recommend doing something. Because um, the other concern is the tick could bite your dog, come in the house, drop off, and then bite you. So. A lot of people stop, although there's, as soon as we get a warm day, the ticks are back out. So it totally depends on the winter. If it's, if it's that winter we had two years ago where it snowed and there was six feet of snow most of the winter, you're fine. But if it snows and then it's 45 one day, the ticks come back out. So it depends on the winter. I treat my dog year-round. In theory, you could if they have diseases, it could go into the dog. So I do try to not squish the body. So yeah. I try not to. to I try to go closer. The other thing is once you squish the body, they're really hard to grab because now the guts are all squished out and they're slippery. 
So it's easier to not break the tick open. So. <laughs> okay, choking. Um, choking happens rarely. I have seen a couple cases where dogs have choked. Um, one choked on a rare like hamburger, grabbed a uncooked patty, and it got stuck in the back of the throat and it choked. I had one young dog that choked on a kibble. Um, and then the most interesting one I had was a German Shepherd that came in with a bouncy ball, like one of those about this big bouncy balls, and it was in the back of the throat. So the dog was breathing but uncomfortable, and we were trying to get the dog held down to sedate it so we could get the bouncy ball out because it wouldn't obviously let us open its mouth and pull it out. And one of the technicians fell across it and basically Heimlicked it and the ball came bouncing out. <laughs> so we said, great, you can go home now. So you can Heimlich a dog if you have to. It's hard, but you know, it's similar to a person just sort of push up behind or if you can fall across the, the bottom part of the abdomen. Sometimes that works. Um, I think most choking cases I've seen, people aren't home when it happens or they don't realize it. Um, the other thing to watch out for is I've had a couple dogs get their heads stuck in bags, like usually chip bags, um, and that they they die fairly quickly. So. Now, a bigger dog, would you try and stand them up? I mean, obviously, if you have I think it's easier to lay them down. If they'll lie flat, but most of them aren't going to lie down, so mm -hmm. then you sort of have to stand them up and try to push up underneath the diaphragm. Yes. And how would you know? So you had that it's a cough, so is that how you, how would you know that? A you lot of them paw at their mouths, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they sort of like, they either look like they're trying to vomit or trying to cough, but nothing's coming out. But it's rare. I mean, I've, I've seen very few cases of choking. So, yes. Um, I had a client um, choke on rawhide at their house. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't know what to do, and she called me. Yeah. Go <laughs> see you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, you know yeah. That, but what could we do if so, a dog did actually start choking on like rawhide or something? I mean, it depends on whether. A lot of times, it's gone down, and they're just uncomfortable. So you can try to feed them something or give them a little bit of water. Um, but in theory, I mean, you could try to Heimlich them if you really think it's stuck in there. But most of them, the for the smaller dogs, you just kind of go around them and just yeah, push under the diaphragm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you also, if they really are choking, you'll start to notice the mucous membranes, the gums look off color. So instead of being pink, they're yeah, even white or they're gray. Yeah. yeah. So. Let's see wounds. So I don't know. Er Dogs and cats both get wounds. Um, cats, I've had a couple impaled cats. So if your cat impales itself, don't pull it off of whatever it is, just bring it in with. I had one that got impaled on antlers. So it was, you know, like the people had a rack of antlers and it was a kitten and it managed to fall onto one of the points. Um, and they were smart enough to just bring the rack of antlers in with the purring kitten. Um, because you need to make sure that that didn't penetrate through. I had a kitten get impaled on a kitchen knife because I think it did something stupid. It was like on top of the refrigerator and it jumped off and it hit the knife block and flung the knife up. And, um, but that's rare. Um, in terms of wounds, whether they need to come in or not, bite wounds should all be seen just because cat bite wounds are usually bad, they get infected, um, which is why I try to recommend people don't get bitten by your own cat. Um, dog bites, what you usually see is like two little punctures but a lot of times the, the bite will actually lift the skin off, and so there'll be a big pocket underneath. If you catch them early, sometimes antibiotics work, but if you don't, they get big abscesses, so it'll be all pus, and it's not good. And then usually the dogs or cats get fevers and don't feel so well. Um, in terms of like little scrapes, that's probably the most common thing we see is, you know, dogs are running through the woods and they get cut by a bramble or a rock. You know, if it's a small, superficial, just through the top layer of skin, you're probably fine to not come in. Um, you can put Neosporin and Bacitracin as long as the dog doesn't lick it off. That's the only problem is a lot of them, if it's on a foot, they spend the next day or two days licking the lesion. Um, bigger wounds <coughs> need to be seen. Um, if it's bleeding a lot, you can bandage it. My favorite stuff for bandaging is vet wrap. So, I think there's also a sports wrap that's similar. I think I started, but it's a um, has a little bit of elastic. I don't want to start. So it has a little bit of stretch to it. Um, it does not stick to the fur, which means it's easy to get off. Um, but if you're at home, you know it's easy to just put. I usually put gauze. You can put paper towel, anything, and just wrap it around so that at least you stop the bleeding temporarily. 
that's what I like for that. Excuse me. Excuse me. My kid just took hers off. I took her in to have her dental and they do oh, yeah. puncture. Yep. And then I found the gauze over here <laughs> and the, the smiley face over yep. there. Yeah. So I guess she didn't like it. No, um, cats, cats just don't just like having things on them. <laughs> I try not to bandage cats because yeah. they hate it. <laughs> So like this dog, this looks like not too bad a scratch, but it was right over the ankle and it was about two thirds of the way around the ankle. So that one did need to come in for stitches. Um, you know, again, it's, it's just through the skin, it's not through any muscle layer. So if it were half that size, I would have said just watch it. But because it went most of the way around, it's going to heal a lot better with a Broken nails. Okay, anybody with dogs has probably a broken toenails. Um, if you are at home, I recommend styptic powder. So it's like a little yellow powder. If the nail's bleeding, you can tap it on there and get the bleeding to stop. If you do not have that, you can use flour, pretty much any type of powdery substance, not sugar, um, but like flour, cornstarch, pack that in. That usually will get the bleeding to stop. Um, if you, the dog has done something silly, like broken, sometimes they'll break nails very high up. Um, those, sometimes you can put a bandage on, but a lot of times those need to be trimmed. So I usually recommend bringing those to a vet. Um, What's the name of that powder? Styptic powder. You used to be able to get it really easily at um, like any pet store, but recently I don't feel like you can see it. I don't see it that often. Um, but that works pretty well for stopping it. Let's see. You can use that on other wounds too. Like if you have a small wound that's bleeding, you can use a stick powder. Okay, vomiting and diarrhea. Cats are tough with vomiting and diarrhea because most cats eat their cat food and they are not going to eat another food. Like most cats will not eat boiled chicken and rice. Um, they might eat the chicken, but they're not going to eat the rice. Dogs will usually eat chicken and rice. So I typically do either boiled chicken or boiled hamburger and rice. Um, if they're doing diarrhea, just diarrhea, it's not super bloody. You can certainly just try doing that to start and see what happens. Um, if they're having really profuse, just, have you guys ever had dogs with nasty bloody diarrhea? Probably have, yes. <laughs> if it's just pouring out of them and it's blood, they probably should be seen. Um, if they've only vomited once or twice, I usually try to take the food away for five or six hours, see if the vomiting stops. If it does, I do the bland diet. If you're withholding food and they keep vomiting, even though they're not getting food or water, then they probably need to come in. Um, the other problem with dogs is what they like to do when they're not feeling well is they either drink an entire bowl of water and then vomit and then continue to do that. So they vomit and then they drink another bowl of water and they vomit. Or they go outside and eat a ton of grass or leaves or twigs or whatever they can find and then vomit. So if they're having an upset stomach, I usually recommend not letting them go either not letting them drink water, not letting them go outside in the yard without supervision. Um, because that seems to be what they want to do to make their stomachs feel better. Yeah. How long is diarrhea acceptable before it becomes? If it's just a little bit of soft still, so probably at least three or four days. Three or four days. Yeah, as long okay. as it's not really bloody. You know, if they're waking up every hour all night to go out, they probably should come in because there's medicine we can put them on to make them feel better. But if it's just a little bit soft or mushy or, and you know, it's, they're not bothering you, they don't necessarily have to come in. Yes. On the grass thing, sometimes I think, I'll see my dog out there also just want to, it doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with it, he just wants to eat the grass. Should I stop him from eating grass? If it doesn't make them vomit, some dogs just eat grass. My dogs eat grass. My dog goes up and down the fence eating grass like a cow. And then he got my neighbor's dog doing it. So the two of them would have a social hour going up and down the fence eating grass. <laughs> But neither one vomited, so I said, okay, they're just being social Send weird dogs. <laughs> I know. Well, they only do the edge. Like. <laughs> but if they're not vomiting, I don't worry about it. Um, some dogs seem to like grass. My dog used to do it in the spring. When the grass first came up, he was very excited. He would go and eat all the grass. But, yeah. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Seizures. Anybody ever had a pet seizure? Yes. You have cats, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So seizures look really scary. I don't know if it's grand mal or not. Seizures can be anything from like one little ear going like this 
to lying on the ground and the whole body's going and there's foam coming out their mouths. Um, a lot of times they will pee when they're seizuring. They look really scary. Um, even tech sign technicians I know that have worked with animals for quite a long time are get nervous when they have seizures. Um, pets will not swallow their tongues, so you don't have to worry about that. I usually recommend not touching them because they don't know what's happening. Um, if they're near the stairs, try to like block the stairs so they can't fall down them. And if they're whacking into like a coffee table or something, you can move that. Um, if possible and you're not panicking, if you can look at a clock and see how long it lasts, that's helpful. Um, everybody always tells me a seizure was at least 10 minutes and most of them are like 20 seconds to a minute. So. <laughs> but it seems like a really long time when your pet is doing that on the floor. Um, the other thing is a vet is sometimes I'll have people video it, you know, because people come in and they don't know whether their pet had a seizure or something else. So if you have your smartphone and you can take a quick clip, sometimes that's helpful if you're not sure. Um, the other thing that can sometimes look like a seizure is fainting. So dogs with heart disease sometimes will be walking just fall over. And um, sometimes you can tell that with a video, sometimes not. I think the first one I had, I was in school working in the intensive care unit, and we had a dog admitted by the neurology department overnight, and right before she left, she said, you know, let's just put the EKG leads on overnight and see what happens. And we were having a really slow night, so the other tech and I were, were talking in between treatments, and all of a sudden the alarm went off, and we said, okay, you know, one of the leads fell off, we'll just go over and fix it. Well, the little schnauzer was lying on his side, and he had no heartbeat. And then after about 20 seconds, he popped up, and the EKG started going again. And we called the cardiologist, and, or the neurologist, and we said, you might want to schedule a cardiology consult for this dog, because we don't think this is a neurologic problem, it's actually fainting. Um, so they can look really similar. Um, and then the other thing with seizures, if they do last more than five minutes, so if you're timing them as more than five minutes, or if they have more than three seizures in a short period of time, that's an emergency. Um, because the big thing with seizures is that the body temperature rises, and that's what causes problems. Um, dogs and cats can be weird for anywhere from an hour or two to a couple days after a seizure. So they're sometimes blind, sometimes they're disoriented, they can circle. Um, you know, all that can be fairly normal. But you do have to be a little careful because if they're, if they're not normally, if their mentation's not normal, they may be more likely to bite you. Um, and if, is it a defined end to the seizure and then the next one starts? Usually. I mean, some of they can go into what's called status epilepticus and those dogs don't come out, they're cats. So, yes. Dr. Hanson, is there anything that we as pet owners might do that would bring on a seizure? No. I mean, the most common cause of seizures is epilepsy. So epilepsy, there's a focus in your brain that just fires abnormally and that causes seizures. Um, those pe pets are usually between six months and six years old. If you have an older dog with seizures, unfortunately, it's probably a tumor. Um, there can be other metabolic things. So we usually do blood work and make sure the kidneys are normal, the liver's normal, the electrolytes are normal. But if that's all normal, then unfortunately, it's probably a brain tumor. And you can do an MRI to look for that. There's medication they can go on if they're seizuring a lot. I've actually done acupuncture on a couple dogs with seizures. So, okay, strain form bodies. So this is mostly cats. Um, anybody with cats, I have one cat that loves to eat anything that's about this long. <laughs> so he has been running through the house with curling ribbon, that stuff you put on presents. He will try to eat my shoelaces while I'm tying my shoes. Um, he is bad. Um, you know, cats, for whatever reason, they like that. The other things I've seen are yarn, thread, tinsel, the, hang, the little stuff that hangs on the tree, Easter grass, like the stuff people put in the baskets for the kids. Cats, for whatever reason, like to eat that. Um, usually you'll notice they're not wanting to eat and they're vomiting frequently. Um, sometimes you'll see stuff coming out of their butt. So you'll actually see string or ribbon or something. Um, it can also get wrapped around the base of the tongue. So I've seen cats with thread around their tongues. I had one cat that tried to eat the needle with the thread and the needle actually stuck through the tongue and the thread was going down. Um, I mean, the nice thing is you just sedate the cat and you take the needle out and the thread comes out and you're good. Um, but yeah, the, the worst one I had was a cat that ate Easter grass and it was all the way from the stomach to the colon, which is the end of the intestinal tract, and I had to make eight incisions to get all the Easter grass out. But he did fine. He just ate Easter grass. 
Um, so especially if you know your cat likes to eat that type of stuff, I try to recommend keeping it away. Make sure if you use dental floss, it's in the trash and the lid is closed because um, they can't actually need surgery. Maybe this cat eats string. <laughs> Even for dogs, is it true like you're not supposed to like pull it out if it is hanging out because it could be wrapped you, around some? You can pull very gently. So, so if, if, it's, you, if it's moving. Yeah, if you can pull it slowly out, you're fine, but you don't want to tug it. Yeah, if there's any resistance. Yeah. Most, a lot of the time it's made it to the colon, a lot of times it will come out. Yes? I had heard that a cat's tongue has little barbs on it and the way mm -hmm. that they're facing, they can only swallow it more and they can't get it out because it's getting stuck on those little... Yeah, it usually wraps around the base of the tongue, so it's not even on the barbs. But yeah, they're usually not going to get it out. I've seen like with fur, like mm -hmm. just it gets to stuck. Spread out, but yeah, she can't. yeah, they do. They point backwards, so yeah, it can be hard. And cats usually don't like people in their mouths either. Yeah. So sometimes if you sedate them, you can get it out. But a lot of times, if it's wrapped around, it goes all the way down. It is a rewarding surgery, though. Then I always go over reason to spay your pet. So everybody always asks me, why should I spay my dog or cat? Um, so if you spay them before the first heat, that protects them best against breast cancer. Um, so they get breast cancer the way people do. Um, as they age, they also can get infections in the uterus. That's life-threatening. Usually those pets are very sick. They're drinking a lot. They're peeing a lot. They don't want to eat. A lot of them are vomiting. They're really lethargic. Um, dogs go into heat. I don't know if anybody's had a dog go into heat, but when they go into heat, they will drip blood for a couple weeks, which is usually not super convenient. Cats go in and out of heat all summer. So cats only ovulate when they're bred, and so most cats will go into heat around April or May, and they'll be in heat until October. And when cats are in the heat, they walk around the house going, meow, 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 <laughs> usually in the middle of the night. Um, so I do recommend spaying them. So this was a mammary mass in a cat. So this was not a, not a very big cat, but this whole thing was a big mass that we took off, and that was the post-op picture. She unfortunately died from that about three months later. Um, mammary cancers in cats are almost always malignant, so that which means they're bad and they're spread. <clears throat> Dogs, sometimes they're benign, so you can take them off and cure the dog. That is an infected uterus in a dog. Um, so they basically, instead of having a nice thin uterus, it turns into a big pus pocket and you basically have to spay the dog. That one had an ovarian mass. So that's a, this big thing over there is a mass on the um, ovary. And that's another dog with a big, big mass that became necrotic. Those can be really smelly. Um, when I worked in New Haven, we had a lot of clients that unfortunately did not have a lot of money and so they would wait on the mammary masses and we had, I had one that was eight pounds on a 40 pound dog um, and they finally did it because the dog couldn't walk. So, and then I had another one that was a little Maltese and it was all smelly. They picked the dog up and it was all necrotic and dying. So. Those dogs did fine. And then neutering, so unneutered male dogs a lot of times will start marking in the house, especially the little guys. The big dogs seem to do a little better but like the little, like Havanese, Yorkshire Terriers, those type of dogs. They love to lift their legs on everything. Um, and it can be really hard to get them to stop. So a lot of times once they start and they do it for a while, even if you neuter them, they still keep trying to mark everything. Um, they can get testicular cancers. As they get older, the prostate gets large. That can cause either straining to urinate, they can strain to poop. Um, they can develop what's called perineal hernias, so they the muscles around their rectum actually get too loose and they can herniate either intestine, bladder, into that area and have problems. So if you neuter them, you don't have those issues. So that's a tumor. The other thing is if, they, if both testicles don't come down into the scrotum, they tend to turn into cancer. So that was a big tumor in a testicle that hadn't come down. <clears throat> and then dental care. So teeth. I don't know if you guys look at your pet's teeth. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, you're supposed to brush daily. I usually recommend once a week. I find what happens when I recommend daily is people brush for the first week and then they never brush ever again. <laughs> so if you could start off once a week, if you're good at once a week for a couple months, then maybe you could go to twice a week. Um, but it definitely will help maintain their teeth. Um, if you don't think you can brush, there's drinking water additives. There's a foam that you can put on that seems to help. There's dental chews. Um, if you can smell your dog from across the room, it 
or cat, it probably needs dental cleaning. Um, a lot of times if their mouths are painful, you'll see them go over to the food like they're really hungry and then they either don't eat or they pick up the food and then either tip their head sideways or they'll drop the food and pick it up again because their teeth are painful. Um, and the other thing with teeth is I find a lot of people tell me they don't think the teeth are painful and then we do a dental and pull out the rotten teeth and then they say, oh, the mouth was painful because now the dog is like a new dog or the cat is like a new cat. So I think teeth do hurt more than they think. Okay, do you do dental? Yeah, we do. Oh yeah, I brought teeth too. Okay, teeth. What about what they call the standing dentals? I don't recommend them because it doesn't address anything under the gum. So the ones that they do without anesthesia, um, they're basically only cleaning like this outer part. They're not getting under the gums. They're not seeing if there's any pockets. Um, so the problem with teeth, this is my sample tooth. So, so this is a fang tooth, canine tooth. So this is what you guys see sticking out of the gum. And people always say, well, why can't you just pull the tooth out? That is what the root looks like. Wow. So that's what pokes up into the, the mouth. <clears throat> and then a lot of the back teeth, these were rotten teeth, but this is a molar from the dog. So there's three roots that go around. Um, so it can be really hard to get those out, even if they're somewhat loose. Teeth, and they all have to be put under when they have yeah. yeah. To do a good job cleaning, you do, because you, ideally you scale them all, and then we probe them with a little probe, and then pull anything that's either loose, um, if you can put the you probe through. How dental cleaning? Depends on the animal. I have one dog that needs dental every year. We clean his teeth, he comes back the next year, the rotten, because he will not let his owners brush. He's a little Italian greyhound, he's a very nice dog, he will not let his owners brush his teeth. Um, I have other, I had one dog, we pulled all the teeth out the first dental. He was 15, he ate dry food till the day he died. So he had no teeth at all. Yes. How do you recommend brushing them at home? Just with water on a brush? There's no, there's an enzymatic toothpaste and you can get little, t either a finger brush if you have a little dog or they make little um, toothbrushes and all you have okay. to do is get it on the teeth. Oh, okay. So you, don't you can teeth. always bring your dog in and we can show you. Okay. <laughs> um, if they'll let you. Yes. yes. Uh, dry dog food as opposed to the can. Dry is better for teeth. Yeah, depending on other conditions, wet is better. Like cats especially, there's a whole debate about whether to feed dry versus canned because the dry is better for the teeth, but the canned is better for urinary problems, for kidney problems. My animals all eat dry food. Yeah. I mean, they have four cats. I'm not opening canned food for four cats every day. <laughs> so, I, can I yes. mention something? Back in that time when we had that pet food scare, mm -hmm. there was melamine in the food. Yeah. I had a cat that got violent <coughs> and died. She oh. was out <coughs> And then I started looking into things like this book, Food Pets Die For. Yeah. And I got a little book that had all kinds of little write-ups by different vets. And one of them had a theory that cats, when they eat dry food for their lifetime, it stresses the kidneys. Yeah. So I had a mother cat and her four kittens. And I did an experiment. I started soaking the kibbles. I just lost the three kittens at 19 and yeah. the mom at like 18. Wow. None of them got kidney disease. Yeah. Hmm. So just having that moisture in the kibble. Yeah. Yeah. I know, it's hard to say. Yes. I was <laughs> passing whenever I was passing and I didn't hear. Dry versus canned food. Dry food is better for teeth. Um, canned food is better for like kidney issues, urinary issues in cats. Canned food is better. Um, and there's certain conditions in dogs too where you're going to want to do canned food. But in terms of teeth, dry food is better. The other problem with, with a lot of pets is they don't chew the food. So if you guys have had animals that vomit, it's, it looks like whole kibble. It's just puffed up because it's got moisture in it. So a lot of pets don't chew their food. Some, some of them do, but a lot of them don't. I got an argument with the dental chew people for cats because their chews are about this big. And I said, well, my cats just swallow them whole. So it doesn't do anything for their teeth if they just run over and go, and it's gone. <laughs> so I said, they need to be bigger. And she just said, well, we're not doing that. Well, it doesn't help. <laughs> so, yes. Is it all right to give a dog that? Table scraps, you know, basically. A little bit here and there. It depends on the size of your dog. So if your dog is this big, like a, a square of American cheese is a lot of calories for your dog. If you have like a Doberman, it's less, fewer calories relatively. I mean, it's not like hamburger, beef, chicken. I usually stay away from anything really fatty. Um, I've had a lot of dogs have issues with bacon. Definitely no bacon grease. My dog gets pizza crust. <laughs> She's been known to have some vegetables. 
like a little bit here and there. I don't recommend it from the table because then the dog learns that if it sits at the table and begs, it gets fed. So I try to make sure we're in a different room. The dog hasn't been following me. But everybody has different rules for their dogs. Give it to them every day. Ideally not. I mean, I had, a, I had an older gentleman client who gave his dog a piece of corn muffin every morning. He had a little cavalier who was fat. And every morning, he would have his corn muffin, and the little dog would have a piece of corn muffin. Yeah. Probably not ideal, because the dog was heavy, but it's not gonna, probably not going to kill the dog. So. Yes? Okay, so I have a cat, and you say dry food is better for the teeth, mm -hmm. and wet food is better for the hearing. Mm -hmm. What if you do a combination of both things? That's, sort of the That's what most people do. Most people do. Most people do a combination. Baking grease is good for the coats, huh? It might be, but it causes really bad pancreatitis. <laughs> really? I worked with a vet who her, her dog was looking not so shiny one morning, so she gave him three tablespoons of bacon grease, and he wound up in the hospital for four days <laughs> because he started vomiting profusely. So you might be able to get away. It depends on your dog. I mean, not regularly either, obviously. Yeah. But it depends on your dog. You know, like labs and goldens tend to have guts of steel, so they can eat whatever. Um, I have a border collie, and she gets diarrhea with everything. So if I give her, like pizza crust is fine, but if she eats anything mm. else weird, she starts having diarrhea. So. <laughs> That's a good question. Greyhounds, no. Okay. Greyhounds don't feed them anything weird. <laughs> um, let's see. So let's see, poisons. Uh, most, most pets don't get into poisons. Probably the big one I see is rodenticide. Um, which they all used to be vitamin K antagonists, so they basically make the pet bleed. Most of them are switched now to one that actually causes um, neurotoxicity, so brain problems, and those do not have an antidote. So if you have animals in your house, I usually recommend not using rat poison if you don't need to. Um, toxic plants, there are a number of them, especially for cats. Um, most plants will just cause like vomiting, diarrhea. The big one with cats are lilies. So lilies will cause kidney failure in cats. So do not have lilies in your house you have, if you have cats. Most of the bulb flowers are toxic to cats, like daffodils, um, amaryllis, tulips. So I try not to have those around cats. And then the other weird one was baby's breath, which I had not realized until I had a little kitten that ate baby's breath and wound up vomiting and being hospitalized for a couple days. Um, Chocolate in dogs is dose dependent, so if you have a big dog that eats two Hershey's Kisses or even a little dog, you're probably fine. The big concern with chocolate is usually baker's chocolate or cocoa. So I know people that do a lot of like baked homemade brownies using that. So if you put three or four squares of baking chocolate in a pan of brownies and your dog eats it, that's potentially toxic. Um, but you don't have to panic for a tiny bit of chocolate. Um, the other thing with most of the chocolate people eat is that it's a lot of sugar. So it's not actually that much chocolate, it's mostly sugar. Um, but if you're worried, always call. Most emergency clinics have a dose calculator and can figure out whether your dog ate enough to be sick. Early on, it causes vomiting diarrhea. The nice thing about chocolate is a lot of dogs vomit most of it up and never have problems. Later, it can cause heart arrhythmias and death. So. Um, the other weird poisons, onions, in large quantities can cause death. Um, I only I saw one dog die from onion toxicity, but ate a pint of freeze-dried <coughs> onions, so, and it died. Um, in cats, Tylenol is very toxic, so one Tylenol will kill your cat. So if your cat eats Tylenol, you need to get it to the emergency room. Um, my neighbors actually did that accidentally. So, and then I had a cat that came in for respiratory problems, so it was breathing really funny, and we couldn't figure out why, and we did x-rays, which were normal, and we got blood work, and the blood was brown, and that cat ate Tylenol because it makes it so you can't bind oxygen to your hemoglobin. But that cat lived. But the owners argued with me. They said, no, he didn't eat Tylenol. I'm like, he ate Tylenol. I'm going to treat him. And by morning, he will be better. And the next morning, they figured out a Tylenol had fallen out of the coat pocket, and the cat ate him. <coughs> and can you make them vomit? You can. Cats, I usually recommend bringing them in. Um, because they're hard to make vomit. Dogs, a lot of times, a lot of people do a couple tablespoons of peroxide at home. Um, hydrogen peroxide can <coughs> cause problems with the esophagus if you do too much of it, but a lot of times that makes them vomit. If the peroxide fails, run them around because it, it turns into oxygen and um, water in the stomach and so it foams up. Outside. Yeah, outside. <laughs> and then if that fails, if you put them in their car and drive them to the vet, that usually makes them vomit. 
<laughs> um, and if all else fails, if you bring them in, we have stuff to make them. <laughs> so what do you think about essential oils that people are using now? Are those safe for pets? You have to be careful. Some of them are not, especially cats, or if anybody has birds, birds don't do well. So Just some of them the are, here. some of them are, and some of them aren't. It depends on what it is, which essential oil it is. I don't know. I recommend not ha just not having them, especially if you think they're going to eat them or touch them. So. Okay, first aid kit. So what to have in your first aid kit? So I have a mini first aid kit in my car in case I'm out with my dog and I need something. Um, so I have a pair of tweezers. I have styptic powder. Honestly, I put that on things everything. Little tiny scrapes, broken nails. Um, I usually have that wrapper bandage material. <coughs> I have tissue glue. I don't know if you can get that, but it's, it's sort of like super glue for skin. So you put it on. I recommend wearing gloves and squish it closed, and that can close smaller wounds. Um, but that's probably, you know, that's sort of the basics. To me, you know, you can buy these kits with tons of different things in them, but you're probably not going to use most of them. Um, the only other thing would be like an antibiotic cream that you could put on a wound. Yeah, an exotic pet. So, anybody have exotic pets at all? No? Yeah. I only have one slide. <laughs> so, most problems in exotic so exotic pets are like hamsters, guinea pigs, birds, reptiles, um, mice, rats, gerbils, those type of things. Most of the problems that we see in them are due to like poor husbandry. So, people either don't know what to feed them, or don't know what temperature to keep them at, or don't change their cages appropriately. Most of the small mammals, if they stop eating, they need to be seen now um, because they're prey animals. And if you're a prey animal and you look sick, you get eaten. So they pretend that they are healthy until they are really not healthy. So like guinea pigs, rabbits, mice, rats all need to come in. Reptiles can go without eating for quite a while. Um, so that may not be as much of an emergency. And then the other thing is that if they lose blood, a small amount of blood in a lot of those guys is a lot. Just because you know, if you have a gerbil that's this big, it's a, it's a big blood loss. That's exotics. Okay, do we have questions? I have yes. a question. Um, my dog, several months ago, she had reverse sneezing. Yes. Which really kind of shocked me when it was yes. happening. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And so what brings that on, and then how would you stop that? When it can happening? be allergies. So reverse sneezing. I don't know if you guys ever, anybody else have reverse sneezing dogs? So usually people describe it as like either the, something's really going wrong, <laughs> and they don't know exactly how to describe it, or the dog's having trouble breathing. But basically, instead of a sneeze where you hear the sound when they're exhaling, you'll hear the sound when they're inhaling, so it's like uh, uh, uh. Um, And basically, it's because in the back of the throat, there's a piece of tissue that covers your airway when you're eating. Um, and when you're breathing, it's supposed to open, and that flips with the soft palate. So they're basically the wrong way. Um, it can be allergy-related. Some dogs, it just happens. Supposedly, if you either pinch the nose or rub the throat really hard, they stop. Um, but it's not, it's not a big deal. Everybody always thinks it's really scary. So they, my dog does it when she is very much excited. They do. Sometimes they do. I think everything's flipping around and then it just flips. Yeah. And we just try to calm her down. Mm -hmm. yeah, it goes, it goes away. That's good. Yeah. Yes. I got a miniature schnauzer. Yep. Spends a lot of time sniffing his butt. Yep. You know, it could be normal. Does he drag his butt on the ground? No. no. It could be anal glands or it could be normal. They have little glands in their butt that squeeze out. So oh, some, yeah, 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 yeah. so you'll smell, it smells like fish usually. Um, but some of the dogs, if they've squeezed out when they're pooping, sometimes they're very interested in it. But if he's, if he's otherwise fine, you know, no swelling or anything, no. you're probably fine. You worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Some companies, they offer pet insurance, health insurance. Yes. Do you, do you recommend it? I do recommend it, um, especially for dogs. Cats are tougher because cats, most of my cat patients are indoor cats. So most indoor cats, like you could have a cat for 15 years before you have a problem. Dogs are outside a lot more and they get into a lot more trouble. Um, so dogs are more likely to break a leg, you know, eat a sock, eat a sponge. Um, and a lot of those surgeries are like four or $5,000. So I usually do recommend it. Um, most of the, there, there are plans that will offer to cover routine care. Most of those aren't worth it. I would just get the emergency coverage and cancer coverage. Yes? When you go into these pet stores to buy uh, flea and tick cough, yep. uh, sometimes they'll say, well, these are good for eight months or something. Yep. 
but they can be kind of expensive. Could, could you recommend one over another? The Soresto. Soresto collars work Ceresto well. Yeah, awesome. those last eight months, they work well. Yeah, good. Um, most of the other ones don't work that well. Yeah. Like you're better off either doing a topical or a chewable. Like Frontline, so Frontline works fairly well. Advantage, Advantix, those work pretty well. Spectra, yes, <laughs> I lean. Um, could you uh, talk about acupuncture and when and why you would use it and how long it takes and whatnot? I can. <laughs> acupuncture. Um, so acupuncture is sticking needles in. So the idea is to try to help the chi or the energy move through the body. Um, most of the patients that I'm doing are elderly that have um, either arthritis. I have one dog right now that tore her cruciate ligament that we're doing acupuncture on. Um, I have one for um, you know, seizures, so one seizure dog. Um, I've had a couple patients that are, there's one specific needle that can help with appetite, so you can for appetite stimulant. And then for whatever reason, acupuncture around the eye and some of these cats that have the chronically leaky eyes, it does seem to work. So I don't know exactly why, but it does work. Um, and it totally depends on what's wrong with the pet. So ideally, if it's something severe, we try to do a couple treatments in a week. You know, ideally two or three in a week. Um, see if, I usually try to do six treatments to see if they're improving and then start spacing them out. Um, it depends on my client. I have clients that can't come in three times a week. So we try to do what we can. Um, and some of them it helps, some of them it doesn't help. I have occasional patients that hate the needles. So my friend's dog I tried to do for shoulder injury and we got all the needles in and then she went and they all flew out across the room. So we stopped doing acupuncture. Um, I have a dog right now that can't use her back legs so we're trying to see if we can get her walking again. She's a little bit better but she still can't walk. It's um, interesting. Yes? Yeah, my cat loves to eat plastic. We target hard in the house. Occasionally she will uh, still get some plastic. The question is, she's never been with but if she's actively eating some plastic, yep. how do you, is there a way you think you can try to stop her? She'll keep chewing and try to. Does she eat plastic bags or does yeah, she yeah, eat plastic, plastic bags? bags. Yeah. Any of that stuff. So I, when I try to run after her or try to do something, try to take it out of her mouth, yep. if I'm unsuccessful, she'll either poop it out or she'll throw up a little bit later. Yep. I didn't know if there was anything, if I did have her with my hands, if anything could make her. I mean, you can try to pry her mouth open. I try to push the gums under those fang teeth, so at least if she closes her mouth, she's biting herself. Um, does she like food? You could trade her, trade her for a cookie. Like, go get a cat cookie or open a can of cat food and see if she'll drop the bag and eat that. So, yeah. Maybe a laser pointer to try to distract it. I don't think, I don't know if that'll work. Like, cats, I don't know. A lot of cats, when they're into eating the bag, they don't care. But if, if she's food motivated, you may be able to distract her with food. Cats are tough because I always encourage people not to get bitten by their cats. Um, you know, dogs are, I think, less likely overall to bite people, even if you're pulling things out of their mouths. Cats don't care. So, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes. I was wondering about, like, uh, weather-related things like heat stroke or yeah. cold or anything like that. Are the things that you should watch out for if you feel like a dog is overheating or... So, yeah, so this time of year, frostbite, I don't, we don't see that much of it because most of my dogs are in the house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a few husky patients that are out most of the winter, but most house dogs go out for five or ten minutes and come in. You know, if it's below freezing, you do have to watch their feet, especially if it's wet at all. So if I go take my dog, like, hiking or something like that for an hour or something. You should be fine because they're running, you know, they're moving and, right. you know, unless they're really short, your dogs like greyhounds will get cold. What kind of dog? It's like a... Boston Terrier mix. Okay, them, though, yeah. So. so you could always put a coat on them. Yeah. Um, I mean, my dog will swim in the middle of winter, so she'll, she's been in like New Year's Day in the water. Right. Um, heat stroke, yeah, Boston's you do have to watch for heat stroke. So any of those squishy face dogs, you do have to be careful when it's probably over about 75 or 80 because they they don't breathe well to start with. So those dogs have little tiny noses, they have little tiny airways, they have all this extra tissue in the back of their throat, which is why when they sleep you hear <laughs> um, so those guys will overheat because the only way that dogs cool off is by panting. Um, so the days when it's hot, ideally don't let them run too much. Um, if anybody has an older dog that you can hear panting from across the room, that dog probably has laryngeal paralysis, which is where the folds in the airway aren't working right. Those dogs will also overheat. Um, yes, they can burn their feet. Yeah, I get a few of those every summer. Um, the, um, 
But yeah, so if they overheat, a lot of times you'll notice the gums, instead of being pink, are like brick red. Um, and then some of them will start to stagger. So instead of being able to walk, they're like falling from side to side. Sometimes the gums will be purple. Um, and those guys, the best thing to do is just get like a cold water blanket and put it over the dog. Don't try to put ice. Um, because the big risk if they're really overheating is that if you cool them too quickly, they'll actually die from that. So you want to try to cool them slowly. And I usually, if, I, if it's at work and the temperature's really high, we'll put a thermometer in and try to cool them until they're about 102 and then take all the stuff off because they'll keep dropping. Um, but if, if you take their temp and it's like 105, 106, they probably need to come in. I think the highest I've seen was 112, but that dog was having a seizure. So. Yes. Snoring. Yes. A lot of dogs. Yeah. yeah, it depends on the position. So fat dogs will snore, fat cats will snore. Um, a lot of times if they're snoring, they're tucked in a ball, so their necks are down. And a lot, there's all this different tissue in the back of their throat, and so that flips around and you'll hear snoring. Um, sometimes getting weight off helps if they're fat. As long as it's not, if it's new and it's getting worse, like you have an an older dog and all of a sudden he's snoring and then it's getting louder and louder, I might be more worried because they can't get tumors in the back of their throats. But, but a lot of them snore. I, I had a little dachshund today that the owner was worried about. It. She's a little dachshund, she sleeps in a little ball. You know, she looks fine, she's running around the exam room. Mm -hmm. Yes? What's the normal body temperature for a dog, you're saying? 101 to 103. Wow. Yeah. Now yeah, can you use a human thermometer or do you need yes. a special? You can use a human thermometer. I would recommend labeling it for dogs only. <laughs> Otherwise, your significant other will not like you. <laughs> so, but yeah, so you can use a human one. Um, I have one in my cupboard at home that says for animals. Um, it does go up the butt. So ideally, lube. If you have a cat, make sure your cat is like cooperative and not going to kill you or don't do it. Um, there are ear ones, but they're not that accurate. And how long do you think it will Until it beeps. Most of them beep now. Okay. So you stick it in and it goes beep, 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 and you're done. So not the old. Don't do the mercury. I don't think you can buy the mercury ones anymore. I have some, but I don't think you can buy them. <laughs> yes. What would cause shivering in a cat besides cold temperature? Sometimes my cat will shiver. The whole body, or? Yeah, but it's not like shaking, shaking. Just from a distance, I could see her when I put my hand on her. I could feel it. But it's only for like a minute. Cats or two sometimes get twitchy. They can have weird, like neurop, like I think yeah. they get a weird sensation and they'll twitch a little bit. I don't worry about it. it. Okay. Yeah. Sure I'm not uh, cats are, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, as long as it's just a little bit known. Just a then. little bit, and then it may not happen again for a yeah. month. And then some of them will react to topical flea and tick meds, so some of them will get a twitching after that because they say they can actually feel it moving in the fat layer in their body. So, yeah. That's strange. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.